Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I am Laura Carfang, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, everyone. Today, we have an amazing recording as part of our NBC webinar series that we produce every other Sunday that's live streamed on Facebook and then repurposed into video for our website as well as audio for our podcast. Today, I am joined with our NBC leadership team. This is so awesome because as we've been growing at survivingbreastcancer.org, we are now creating various committees and task forces and really you name it, a community of women that are going to help us grow and shape the direction of our organization. Today, I am joined with Abigail Johnson, who is moderating our discussion. I am also here with our leadership team. We have Angela Rose, Kathleen Friel, Christine Carter, and Don Oswald. All of these women have their own unique experiences being diagnosed either de novo with metastatic breast cancer or had a recurrence that metastasized to other parts of their body. They share their personal stories, their wisdom and hope, as well as what we have coming down the pike at survivingbreastcancer.org. If you're not already following us on Twitter, please hop over to Twitter and find us at SBC underscore ORG. You can also follow us on Instagram, survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word. So of course, plenty of ways to engage with our community, learn about upcoming events, and join in the discussion. Because everybody has their own motto. So mine is living open, open to whatever's coming at me next. I've told my cancer that it's okay if it lives with me, but if if I die, it dies. And so let's just work this out together. Welcome to the conversation. Hi, my name is Dawn Oswald, um, diagnosed with breast cancer, 2008, the first time, stage two, um, possible stage three, you never could get a biopsy of the hip, so we just went ahead and did chemo, six rounds, radiation for two and a half um, months on on my hip as well, because there was a possible spot on my hip, but just couldn't get the biopsy of it, so... And then we went on tamoxifen for two years, side effects from that. We switched to aromacin for eight years. Um, So a total of 10 years, I went my 10-year mammogram. And uh, they found a lump in my right chest, my breast, same breast, um, because I had a lumpectomy the first time. And they did a biopsy of that and said that my cancer had returned, that I'm stage one and Fortunately, my insurance would not pay for a PET scan. So as a veteran, I advocated for myself and I talked to my VA doctor and asked for a PET scan and he got the PET scan. And after the results of that, I was stage four because it already spread to my bones um, and my lungs. So stage four since 2018. On my fourth line of defense, I'm actually doing really well. I started my fourth line three and a half weeks ago, and I feel great. I have more energy. Uh, My sugars are back to normal, and my blood pressure even went down. So I had low blood pressure. So the reason why I'm telling you that is because don't be alarmed to start a new medication and don't worry about side effects of a new medication just keep track of it. And then with all these wonderful groups, you can ask other patients what kind of side effects they have and discuss with them. And with surviving breast cancer, I've been with them for two and a half years, helping them with a metastatic breast cancer group that we held um, every third Thursday of the month. And I also started a new hobby, making beanies. So winter hats, you can wear them during the summer too, if you want. I make beanies for um, the surviving breast cancer group ladies, that whoever wants one. So, And I'm here to help any way I can. I, I like, Don, how you refer to the lines of treatment as lines of defense. Even though I don't like the whole battle metaphor generally, that that's a, a new way to look at it, uh, a line of defense. But um, I'm sure you're glad to be off of PICRE, uh, which... Um, does cause the hyperglycemia, which is what she was referring to as far as your sugars. What what are you on now? I'm on a Finitor and a Robeson again. All right. And I do have so a new I'm- model because I wanted a model because everybody has their own model. So mine is living open, 
open to whatever's coming at me next. So. Awesome. Great. Wonderful. Well, we're very appreciative of your leadership in the Thursday Night Thrivers group. Um, and I am sure that lots of people are enjoying a a warmer head. It's it's amazing how your um the heat escapes when there's no hair on the top of your head. So <laughs> are you still in Alaska, Don? I'm in Alaska. Um, we're actually moving back to Texas at the end of this month. You know, don't let medicine breast cancer um stop you from doing anything. Cause like I said, I'm four years out. I moved to Alaska just to go explore Alaska. So I call a year long vacation and I did whatever I want when I can. So just go out and enjoy life people. That is a great reminder. What is it? What is it? Get busy living or get busy dying. Right. Isn't that a uh, Shawshank redemption quote? <laughs> uh, so great. Thank you, Don. I appreciate you. You are up, my friend. Kathleen is coming to us from New York. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's, a, it's so great to be in a park. Oh, that's crazy. Um, I'm Kathleen Pearl. I was diagnosed with MVC four years ago. Four years ago, just like Don. Was your breast cancer a recurrence that spread to metastatic disease, or were you diagnosed immediately with metastatic? I didn't have breast cancer or that. It was a de novo diagnosis. So right off the bat, stage four in my spine. And um, yeah, four years. And doing well. Um, I've been on a variety of drugs, but for me, the changes were due to side effects, not to growing like I, I could work and I have a vet skin on Thursday, so we'll see how that goes. I really love this piece. I found you at some point during COVID. I figured out my timeline of COVID is like so poor. So <laughs> it's really fun. I go to the first drivers. And then also the first week of the month, MVC um, gathering. And I love. The book club also that's a lot of fun. That then writing with chunks and yoga and Zumba with Angela here. She's much better than I am. I'm kinda of like ah but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um yeah, I agree with Don. I just I'm just trying to live as best I can and be involved. I, I, I still work full time. I'm a neuroscientist. I work. Kathleen, in addition to having and living with MBC, you also work full time, don't you? What do you do for your day job? I run a research lab to, to develop new therapies for children with cerebral palsy. So it's really, really fun. And I'm really grateful that I'm able to do it. It's even four years in, when I was first diagnosed, I didn't know what the future was. I mean, nobody knows. So I've really got to be where I am. And I've really got to be good friends with all of you. And like Kathleen is our she's a doctor she's a PhD neuroscientist and um you know we're very lucky to have you Kathleen especially having the experience of having something else other than MBC having cerebral palsy yourself and having that experience of being I mean you're you're working in an ableist oriented 
job in in a lot of ways. And you've taught me a lot about advocating as somebody who needs accommodations and that sort of thing. As you're working and balancing being a patient and and working, how, how do you do that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I just do it. I really love my work. So it, yeah, I, want, I want to do it. Absolutely. And Kathleen talked about how with the Thursday Night Thrivers group, even though that happens every Thursday, there is once a week when the NBC folks go into a separate room to have conversations about what's different uh, in the breast cancer experience uh, between early stage and uh, stage four. Um, she also mentioned a whole lot of the other offerings from SBC, the book club. Yes, I love that Kathleen shows up to almost all of our programs because we do it virtually. So no matter where in the world you are, as long as you have an internet connection and the time zone works out for you, you can join our Zumba class, our breast cancer book club uh, meetup. You can do our writing therapy classes, et cetera. And for me, it's just like hanging out with our friends. So I really value all of you guys who show up each week and each month to our programs And I know we've been talking about the NBC Thursday Night Thrivers group. And I just want to say, because you guys have already put the feelers out there, that the community wants to meet more than once a month. So we are exploring opportunities to meet more often, possibly twice a month. And so definitely check out our website, survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events for the latest. And stay tuned because more exciting NBC programming is on its way. Thanks to all these amazing ladies. So let's turn things over to Kristen. Do you want to share a little bit about your story and how you were diagnosed? My timeline is very similar to Dawn's. In 2008, I was diagnosed with a lump or I was diagnosed from a, um, a mammogram, but mine was stage zero. It was a DCIS. And so I opted for a lumpectomy rather than a double mastectomy, which is what my doctor would you, suggested. Would you tell everybody what DCIS stands for? Ductal carcinoma in situ, which means it hadn't traveled outside the, the, the duct. Um, and I did follow up. I did, I did, you know, kind of over follow up with ultrasounds and radiate and uh, mammograms for the next seven years, then moved back to America from South Africa. Um, and then just did yearly mammograms. And it was also my 10 year mammogram was coming up and I started turning yellow and went to the doctor. I'd had a clear nine year mammogram, but by the 10, I was metastatic. And I was very close to death when I was diagnosed. My, I was in liver failure already and oh, wow. got incredibly lucky with surgery that helped open up my bile ducts and because um, they were blocked by a tumor. And that was four years ago. I've probably been on five lines of treatment, all oral at least initially, and have just recently gone on to Taxol. And that's my breast cancer story. So Taxol is an IV chemo. Are you getting that once a week or or are they spreading it out for you? Once a week for three weeks and then a week off. Okay. So that's just an example of how the treatment for early stage and metastatic disease, even if we take the same medication, is Mm -hmm. often given on a different timetable because typically... In early stage treatment, people will do 12 weeks of one week, um, one uh, treatment a week. But for, for those of us who are metastatic, they give us a little more break. Uh, so how yeah. many treatments of Taxol have you had? I think I've had 10 or 11. Oh, wow. So far. Okay. Not round. Are you icing, but... are you icing your fingers mm-hmm. and hands? <laughs> no, because a few, a few people said not to bother. And... Oh. That, it, that they had no real evidence that that made a difference. Um, and I had I originally started by using a cold cap for chemo, uh, for IV Taxol, because it does cause hair loss. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but the cap didn't work for me either. My hair fell out anyway. This is someone else's hair. <laughs> and I would just borrow now and then. <laughs> And they the work so much nicer now these days, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it looks really, you look beautiful. Thanks. It, does. it looks great. 
Um, and the stuff that at, I first discovered SBC, I'm not even sure how, and I got lots of emails um, every week for a long time without opening them because there was something about not wanting to be a member of this club, I think. And then one day I read it, opened it, opened one up and read it all the way to the bottom of the page. And within one page was already thinking when I saw this little blurb saying, we're looking for volunteers. Are you a writer or a poet or I don't know what else? Um, click here to volunteer. And I did. And I, 14 years ago, left corporate communications to become a certified coach and a life coach and a positive and a coach in positive psychology and teenage and adolescence and loved the coaching work, but also loved to write. And so I offered to write some I was I had my own blog and also offered to write some blog posts for SBC, and it has turned into a, a fairly regular weekly column called Dear Kristen, where people can write in questions for anything kind of more uh, the emotional side of living with breast cancer. I have no medical training whatsoever, but the tools that I learned in my own coaching work have been my savior. I had a gratitude practice already. I was super clear on what was important to me, although it became hyper-focused when I was diagnosed, you know, um, my family in the middle of that target and then things, you know, moving out from there. And so I feel like there's some way that I might be able to help even one other person, um, deal with some of the hard stuff to feel resilient, to realize what heroines we are doing this on a daily basis. Um, that's my motivation. It's wonderful. And I definitely found after I was diagnosed, just somebody saying I'm having the same experience that you are just mm -hmm. knowing that you're not the only one having a particular experience is oddly strangely comforting even if it's a terrible experience so because you know, uh, when we because we when we go into fear we feel alone yeah if people have questions uh Kristen is um our the person who will answer them so um uh, how Laura can they submit questions Yes, we're so fortunate to have Kristen as part of our editorial team. So thank you. We are so grateful. So anyone can submit questions. They can go to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash dear Kristen. She will receive the inquiry and you will receive a response in an upcoming newsletter. And all of her blogs do live and have residency on our website as well. So you can always search for past questions or check out um, upcoming questions in case you missed a newsletter. You can also contact Kristen directly at Kristen at survivingbreastcancer.org. That's K-R-I-S-T-E-N at survivingbreastcancer.org. So Kristen, after leaving corporate, how did you get into coaching? I went on a retreat with Martha Beck, who's an author and sort of one of the first life coaches and did it as a birthday present to myself. Um, and by the end of it felt so not just peaceful, like just zhuzhi through my whole body about myself and my place in the world. And I thought, this is what I want to be doing. And, um, the reason I started working with kids is because I thought if somebody had taught me about what my Inner, inner strengths were my my own unique superpowers when I was a teenager it might have made a huge difference in my confidence so I wound up teaching in schools in South Africa and um loved it loved it loved it do most people in South Africa speak English or is English taught in the school most of, there are 11 official languages in South Africa and English is one of them and probably the, the most often used across the different language groups, cultural groups. So what brought you and your husband back to the States then? Well, our kids were graduating from high school and my parent, one of my parents was quite ill and we just thought it would be a good time to make the jump um, so that 
so that the kids had a, 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 a bigger range of colleges to choose from and so that I could be near my father. Uh, and we, I'm, from, I'm from Denver and we now live west of Boulder in the mountains. So oh, it's turned Denver. out really well. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you, Kristen. We're we're excited to have you on uh, the leadership team and appreciate all that you bring to, to the table, especially from the writing perspective. Um, so, Angela, we are over to you, our uh, movement guru. <laughs> Would you tell us how you were diagnosed and uh, what you have been doing for SBC? Of course, of course. Well, hello, everyone. I was uh, originally diagnosed in 2012 at least stage three, um, was starting on a career as a nurse practitioner at the time. So it was a really tough, um, uh, tough time in my life, um, for my family. I had a four-year-old daughter at home as well. So it was really tough for her and, um, just continued to work, um, went through all the treatments. So, uh, did the standard chemotherapy, bilateral mastectomy with um, some axillary node dissection, like partial axillary node dissection on the right, and then had radiation and went on tamoxifen for a while. I wanted to have another child and thought that might be a possibility, but unfortunately uh, it didn't work. I was re-diagnosed in 2016 with stage four cancer and went on um, you know, three, three different lines of treatment. Um, I'm now six years out from diagnosis of metastatic disease and doing well. I work in the hospital. I manage my teenage daughter at home and um, I stay very active with SBC teaching Zumba for Movement Mondays. I'm also uh, very passionate about fitness. I ride my bike to work uh, each day and I feel that that has been very beneficial for my physical and mental health. Other than that, um, gosh, I that's take a lot right there. <laughs> I, I see patients prior to surgery, lots of women going through breast surgery. So I feel like I have a unique perspective and, and can help them, you know, ease anxiety as they're getting ready for surgery. I also see them on the other side, waking them up in the PACU. So um, it's, a, it's a really interesting job that I have. It's very busy, somewhat stressful at times, but I love it. I love helping people. I love supporting SBC. I love teaching Zumba. <laughs> Life is, that is wonderful. I'm always amazed at the people who are able to keep working and keep active and, and all of that, even through all the treatments, because not, not all of us have been able to, to do that. Uh, so what treatments have you been on, Angelo? Well, I originally started on Ibrance and Letrozole. That was an initial treatment. And then I went on a clinical trial for immunotherapy. So I did two drugs uh, that are standard of care for melanoma, which is uh, nivolumab and ipilimumab. And uh, that was a very tough, uh, tough trial. And then mm. now I'm on Resinio and uh, Faslodex. So... Uh, doing pretty well. I've been on this line for two and a half years. It's not easy. Um, still hard. Uh, it's very tiring. I wear this lovely, not original hair, and it seems to make me uh, seem normal when I go to work <laughs> for the most part. It is amazing how when you are not the typical cancer patient look like, like I am right now without hair, that you can pass. And people don't even know or may not even know that that you're sick. Do you share your diagnosis at your work? No, <laughs> that might be a uh, dear Kristen question in the future. Because <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. You would think that healthcare would, would be the most um, understanding of the fields um, when it comes to uh, limitations, but I, I haven't found that to be true in the past. And so I'm a little more hesitant these days to share information because you know, can be, be perceived as a weakness. And that's the last thing I want to be um, worried about is job security. When I run the legal clinics for, for Project Life, that is one of the major questions that people come to talk about is what do I do? Who do I tell? And while the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, does cover us, um, 
and protect us. There are a lot of things that employers do that, um, you know, like not scheduling you um, that, that can kind of push you out of a job without a violation of the ADA. But, you know, they're, they're, their perspective may be different from an employee's perspective. So what, what you shared is what I hear from a lot of people that, um, you know, they, they, they keep it under wraps as long as they, they possibly can. So how old is your daughter now? You said she was a teenager. She's 14. Okay. Going All right. high school this year. Oh my goodness. I remember those years. <laughs> Um, you know, I didn't ask you guys to share your subtype. So I'm assuming, Angela, that you are um, hormone positive. Are you also HER2 negative? Yes. Okay. And Dawn, is that the same subtype that you have? Yes. Okay. How about you, Kristen? Yes. Same one? Okay. Yes. yes. And, and I, yes. Know, <laughs> I know Kathleen has has the, the that same subtype. So um, it is the most uh, prevalent subtype, whether you're early stage or, or late stage. And so we have the dubious honor of having the most treatments available to us. And um, so we also didn't talk about metastatic sites. So Don, where are your meds? You name it. <laughs> um, <laughs> man, I have it all, all over my bones. Um, femur, both hips. I have it in my back. I have it on my ribs, my sternum, and my on my skull, in my lungs. Now on my liver, two lesions on my liver, and then um, I had two lesions on my spleen two years ago, and now they're regrowing. So on my spleen, which was weird, and I asked my doctor about that, and she's like, "Meh, you're metastatic." <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Where else can it go? <laughs> Do you have duct ductal carcinoma or do you have lobular? You know, I, I couldn't tell you, but mine was up up here and it was mm. growing that way. That's why it started hurting because I got it checked the first time. They did a needle biopsy in the office and I guess maybe they missed it and said it was nothing. But he did tell me the only way to tell is to get it cut out. But if it's not bothering you. I said, well, it's not really bothering me. So I just thought it was a cyst. So he said, well, when it bothers you, come back. And literally a year and a half later, it started growing and it hurt. Wow. And he took it out and that was it. Told me the next day, it's cancer. I'm like, oh, great. It's been there all this time. So it spread to my lip nodes the first time. Okay. So there's a reason for everything. My daughter was going through cancer. So I think that mine was misdiagnosed on purpose so I can take care of her. So. There's a reason for everything. So I look at, I look at the bright side, all the positives. So. Sure. And being able to look back and see how things worked out can help quite a bit. Kathleen, do you have ductal carcinoma as well? Yes. Okay. And where are your meds? In my spine. Haven't gone anywhere else. That's good. That's very yes. good. Yes. <laughs> how about you, Christine? What is your subtype and, or do you have ductal carcinoma? I well? think so. I don't know. Mine was so widespread by the time they caught it that nobody ever said what kind it was other than um, ER positive. Okay. And I've got it in my bones. I got it in my jaws, the most recent place that it spread to late last year. Yeah, pretty much all the bones from my shoulders through here down to about my hips and in my liver. But it's stable at the moment. And my doctor has said since I started on Taxol that it's actually been staying pretty stable. I'd love to clear the damn stuff up, but I'll take stable <laughs> if that's all I can get. It is amazing how our uh, perspectives change and stable is good. You know, not, not remarkable becomes a really good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've told my cancer that it's okay if it lives with me, but if it, if I die, it dies. And so let's just work this out together. So Angela, is yours ductal as well? Yeah. So my oncologist uses this term, um, bad behaving ductal. So it doesn't, uh, okay. it doesn't follow the, 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 um, normal pattern. So it's a little more lobular like, and I've heard that from some women that they have this. Um, so I have it a lot of places in the pelvis. Um, it was all, you know, surrounding the ovaries and, um, in the bones and liver, but a lot of pelvic mat, uh, mets initially. So, um, so it's harder to detect on scans, unfortunately. So it's a little bit more of a 
elusive cancer, I guess. Mm. Yeah. So those uh, those big bones with lots of blood flow is where the Mets can get a, a lot of fuel. Um, but it, one of the reasons I was asking, so I have mixed type uh, ductal with lobular features. And so I both had um, lesions that were hard, like a lump, and then ductal, which tends to be more like lace, like coming off of it. So um, that's why a lot of people do get misdiagnosed is when it's lobular because it doesn't show up like you would normally see on um, an exam. So Abigail, what about you? Tell us about your diagnosis. I was diagnosed de novo, but we didn't know it for two months. So in January of 2017, while I was tandem nursing, I felt a lump in my left breast and thought it was a clog because it was exactly where I had had clogs during my four years of breastfeeding. And I was 38. So prior to any mammograms, went to my lactation specialist, thought it must be something related to breastfeeding. She said, "Mm, doesn't feel right. Went to my PCP, um, who said, 95% sure this is absolutely nothing. You're so young. All of the things those of us who are premenopausal hear from the various medical professionals. But the one thing that I appreciated about her was she said, let's just go ahead and send you for a mammogram just to make sure. So I had my very first mammogram. I sprayed milk all over the machine. The technician had no idea what to do with all of the the milk that I had. Um, But they, it was a diagnostic mammogram and ultrasound and they wanted to do a biopsy right then. But my primary care physician had said, no, no, there's this interventional radiologist who's also a breast surgeon she wanted me to go to her to do the biopsy. So I went the next Monday and found out, um, you know, that it was suspicious. So they, they did the, the biopsy in her office. And I found out in April of 17 that I had breast cancer. The interesting thing was, is that um, I was node negative. So they, um, I did a lumpectomy, um, didn't say anything about the fact that I had been limping because in my mind, your breast has nothing to do with your leg. <laughs> Right? I mean, I think that's one thing that that I've understood much more now. The body is so interconnected that if you're having a symptom in one place, even if you don't think that it's related to what's going on, always good to tell your doctors. Because I didn't say anything about how I was limping and my leg hurt pretty bad. I did a lumpectomy. I was node negative. Uh, they did not do a dissection. They just tested my sentinel nodes, which are the nodes that you know first receive the fluid from the the breast area. There were four of them that they took out. So they were, I was node negative and then began the regular chemo for early stage, which was adriamycin and cytoxin, affectionately known as the red devil. And um, my, the nurse made a mistake and checked the box for them to check my tumor markers. So through a medical mistake, we found out that my tumor markers were sky high. No tumor markers are just um, proteins or other things in the blood that show that some kind of metabolic activity is going on. And mine were in the hundreds and that's not where they're supposed to be. And so, um, we, um, I got a call the day after my first chemo treatment, "Eh, something's up with your numbers. We're going to send you for more tests. And so I went in for a bone scan and a CT scan and to say that um, my bones looked black because there were so many mets, the, the the person that was actually doing the scan said some things that I didn't understand in the context of what was going on. He kept telling me that he's seen lots of people with lots and lots of mets and they come back later and they're fine. I'm like, why are you telling me this? I don't understand. And then I, then I understood when the doctor told me um, to come in and um, So within a week, I had titanium rods put in both femurs because my right femur in particular, the one that was hurting, was quite literally one bad step away from shattering completely. I'd been walking around with a five centimeter tumor in the middle of my femur. No idea. Pain, but you know, I was just dealing with it, right? Like we we tend to deal with it and don't complain. Finished adriamycin and cytoxin. And one thing that my husband and I have talked about is just at times... 
we wondered if it would have been better not to have done chemo at the very beginning, instead just gone on, you know, just gone on to um, targeted therapy, like you guys have talked about, which is kind of the typical stage four experience that you um, are typically not offered surgery, you're typically not offered significant chemo at the beginning, typically you just go into targeted therapy, like an Ibrance or Cascali or Verzenio. But um, I really do think because I had such a high disease load, that the significant chemo at the beginning was enough to get a hold of it so that then the targeted therapy was actually able to work. Um, and I got almost five years off of targeted therapy, um, bone only, until this January when it spread to my liver. So just went through Taxotere, which is similar to, to Taxol. Um, and, uh, but only, I only got it once every three weeks and it was still <laughs> quite a bit. But paired with the Loda, which is a oral chemotherapy that's been around for lots and lots of years. It's a lot to be on targeted therapy. It's a lot to be on chemotherapy. Um, I, I am thankful for the years that I got on targeted therapy where I was able to pass for a healthy person. I had hair and I had some amount of energy. Um, my boys were two and four. And when I was initially diagnosed, they are seven and nine now. So um, you probably heard them because they're not quiet. Um, and they're also very active. So, um, you know, I think there are pros and cons to having kids or, or not having kids or having older kids or having, you know, wh whatever it is in, in your life that gets you out of bed in, in the morning. Um, so one of the things that we talked about um, when we got together was to put together some seminars. <laughs> We're going to call them seminars. I have a hard time figuring out the right labels. My whole approach is if there is an interest and a demand, let's go out and build it and create. So this is why I love these types of open mic conversations, because you guys are the ones who have these brilliant ideas that we really want to bring to fruition and execute. So some of the ideas that we are talking about and that are actually up on our website for people to currently go and get resources, information, RSVP to our workshops and seminars are coming up. Let's see, we have our legacy workshop. That's going to be a two to three hour half day workshop on a Saturday in August, I believe at the end of the month. And I encourage you to RSVP sooner than later because we're going to be actually mailing out materials so that we can have a hands-on experience, whether it's letter writing, doing some journaling, doing some um, like positivity cards. We've got a whole slew of activities. We're also bringing in some guest speakers to also talk about how to create legacies using video and leveraging other forms of technology. This October, we thought it would be fantastic to bring in some experts on mindfulness during the crazy month of October. You know, it's I, I like to think of it sometimes as ostrich syndrome. Like it's so much and so overwhelming. We want to advocate. We want to talk. We want our voice to be heard. And then at the same time, I feel like some of us just want to shut down. So how can we be mindful during stressful situations? And so that'll be coming up in October. And then looking ahead to 2023, Don, I appreciate you bringing some, some insight into this, doing some FT, no, what is it? EFT tapping. So yes, we're going to be working with Jondi, who I believe is the founder of EFTinternational.org. So we have some exciting programs coming up that way. And as Abigail and I were talking at the earlier part of the show, really just enhancing our website, creating a landing page specifically for Metastatic, providing all of our webinars and resources all in one place. So it's super easy for everyone to find. I can't thank you enough. Abigail, Kristen, Kathleen, Don, Angela, I am so honored to have all of you part of our NBC leadership team and supporting the great work we're doing here at survivingbreastcancer.org. And thank you all for listening and tuning in week after week here on Breast Cancer Conversations. Please be mindful that all of our content and information is for educational purposes only and is never a substitute for medical advice. If you want to hang out again, please check out survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events, where you can RSVP to our Thursday Night Thrivers weekly meetup, our Movement Monday classes, workshops, seminars, and so much more. We can also continue the dialogue online via social media. Our Instagram handle is survivingbreastcancer.org, all one word, and you can follow us on Twitter at SBC underscore ORG. Until next time, keep on thriving.